kid. Seriously. So, Mark, how's it going? Oh, it's going pretty well. Good. Well, we just finished watching about, I don't know, three minutes ago, season three, episode three of True Detective. So we are going to jump in. This is all spoilers, as always. If you haven't watched the episode or any of True Detective, just don't listen to this. Go watch the show and then come back and listen to this multiple times to give us more likes and feel better about ourselves because people validated us on the Internet. This is an episode that I would describe as the suspects episode, because I think we were given a lot of suspects to go off of in this one. Again, we rotate between the three time frames we're working on. We spend a lot of time in 1980 where we find out the kids were lying to their parents about where they were going. They're probably meeting with a mystery person who is giving them toys and creepy notes that are somehow comforting but somehow also very creepy. We also investigate the mom's work a little bit and we find out that there might be a brown sedan and a mysterious African-American man with a scar that is involved as well as my number one suspect, the junk man, gets beaten by some of the local townspeople. We also spend some time in 1990 where we get to meet more modern day Stephen Dorff, who we haven't seen in the first two episodes. I guess 1990 Stephen Dorff, who looks a lot like 2019 Stephen Dorff. I, I like to call him cowboy boot Stephen Dorff. <laughs> yeah, perfect, perfect. We meet him. He is working on a task force to re-examine the case because in 1990 they have found the fingerprints of Julie at a Walgreens. Wayne is definitely struggling with life in general as he freaks out at Walmart and gets into a fight with his wife who is trying to reinvestigate the case kind of in her own way with some local detectives. And then we spend some time in the 2000s with elderly Wayne who is still struggling with his memory, struggling to get along with his son and deal with what's happening to him, and also doubting his earlier investigation, and then having a hallucination where his wife says some not-so-nice shit to him to round out the episode. This was pretty jam-packed as far as information. So, Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit about your thoughts about this one? First off, another strong episode. Uh, you're right. It packed in a lot of stuff, especially it really hit it hard at the end when he's hallucinating his wife. But it was a sprinkled throughout. Also, when he was being inter- when Wayne was being interviewed by the, the TV producers, that there was apparently gaps in the investigation that Wayne likely knows about uh, information that was suppressed. Uh, from the official paperwork that he is aware of, um, specifically around the brown sedan, likely who was in it. And his wife says something very creepy at the end about how you left some unfinished business in the woods that you're afraid they're going to find out. Once again, I, I think really cementing that this is about this case in this case only that it's definitely not going to be like season one where it's this larger unfolding you know ongoing murder spree that has to be stopped it, this is much more of just a puzzle to be put together um, so that made me very happy I'm really feeling comfortable with the direction this is going and I think it's going to have um, a much more for me satisfactory conclusion already that I believe then season one did. Um, so, I mean, you gave a recap, but what were your thoughts on it? So I, I really enjoyed this and I, I called it the suspect episode because one of the things that this episode made me do, which I think is the hallmark of a great mystery is it, it had me thinking, Oh, it could be this person. It could be this person at multiple turns. Now I presented my theory last week about the junk man. And I still think that that is an, a, a relatively valid theory and they gave us they gave us some hints that it could be him as well right because he gets beaten Mm -hmm. by those guys and i just want to take a side note and say that of all weeks and obviously this wasn't planned by the production crew but the junk man is played by a first nations actor he's i looked him up he's cree from saskatchewan Mm -hmm. and the guys beating him are wearing american flag hats and the the junk man is a vietnam veteran and and whatnot. So that that hit me a little hard, actually, which was unintended, because obviously this was filmed before the events of this week in real life that kind of mirrored that. 
Yeah. But then we do find out later that he carries some mysterious bag that obviously could be a body, but probably could be a lot of different things. So they point us in his direction. The mom stuck out to me in this episode a lot, and they do investigate her place of work. We find out in the 1990 version that she has died. Uh, we also, my first thought on those creepy notes was that they could be from her when I, I saw those. Mm. And that maybe the son died accidentally and she was trying to get the two kids away from the dad. And it, it might just all be a tragic mistake, basically. And she's now staying with the dad in the 80s just to get suspicion away from her. So I, I thought about that. She could obviously be in cahoots with the cousin. One of the things we learned about the dad in 1990 is that he is really heavily invested in religion. He's also sober. We know in 1980 that Will's body was found in First Communion pose and that we find pictures of Will when he was doing his First Communion that mirror each other, so it pointed at him. We obviously have the brown sedan and the mysterious man with a scar that we haven't seen yet, but we are going to see at some point. It looks like next episode we're probably going to see. So I think they pointed us in a lot of different directions, which I, I really enjoyed. I, I noticed your comments about the wife and the hallucination saying to Mahershala Ali, Wayne, uh, about what you did in the woods. And I actually went in a different direction than you did because I think this is going to turn out to be a little bit of a misdirect. Now, one, one thing that has occurred to me, and I think this would be the worst possible scenario, the worst way for this show to end would be to find out that Mahershala Ali was actually the killer and that he just can't remember. That would be a horrible M. Night Shyamalan way to go about it. But uh, what I really think this show, the strong theme that's emerging for me is the the trauma of war and how that kind of is inescapable the rest of your life. And I think we see that throughout Mahershala Ali in this episode. We see the breakdown he has at Walmart, the stress he has with his wife. I, I think what happened in the woods could be referring to Vietnam and not referring to this specific case and about how the tragedies he saw there have shaped his life, basically. And I think you could say the same thing about the junk man and where he's at. I think this is going to be a reoccurring theme, the, the Vietnam War, because they talk about it often, especially in the 1980 scenes. So I think that might be where they were going because it's a little too on the nose in episode three to be like what you did in the woods. But that's that was just what occurred to me during it. Yeah, but there's a, I, I think there's a lot of stuff that's on the nose um, in this episode. And that actually gets me to um, an earlier scene that I thought was too on the nose was the one you referenced about the, the guys in the pickup truck beating the trash man. Uh, because that is such an obvious trope in, in, you know, in any kind of drama involving, you know, murders and, uh, you know, a, a non-white person being a suspect and putting that scene in there as I'm watching it, I'm thinking, okay, this is clearly in, in a lesser show, this would clearly be a way of establishing that he's not a suspect because you wouldn't have these awfully redneck characters beating up who turns out to be the actual bad guy, right? This is the moment when a lesser show would turn our opinions in his favor as an, a person who is being unfairly accused and, and oppressed by the neighborhood. But this isn't a lesser show. So that made me thought, oh, okay, are they putting this on the scene, though, the on the nose scene in there? to make me make that association with lesser shows to then throw me off when it actually is the fact that, Hey, they just happened to beat up the right guy in this case. Um, and then later on when he goes to his own shed in a panic and he pulls whatever is in that green bag out, takes it outside and we don't get to see what is again, is such an obvious trope and an, an obvious scene and thing to do in a mystery that I'm just thoroughly confused now because they're so on the nose with this character, with the clues about him. And this isn't an on the nose show. At least I don't think it's going to be. It, it hasn't been previous seasons and it doesn't seem to be leading that way. That left me pretty thoroughly confused. Um, as far as the, the Woods comment, my first thought about it was I was thinking two parallels with the first season. And in the first season, we have two cops who are investigating a crime. It something happens they break up they get back together after an inquiry says hey there's new evidence 
And so it, it's following that pattern. And in the first season, the thing that happened that broke them up was Woody Harrelson and uh, Matthew McConaughey gunning down one of the two killers because Woody Harrelson got really mad at him and then covering it up. So then to have this comment of, oh, what you did in the woods made me immediately think, oh, okay, is this another parallel I'm supposed to be drawing to season one? And also the fact that they talked about how Cowboy Stephen Dorff got shot and as a result he was promoted and playing golf most of his time. So, but then again, that's another such kind of an obvious misdirect or an obvious on the nose that I'm just confused. And Which is why this is a great episode because they, they give you so many directions where you go, yeah, it's obvious it's that, but there's about seven of them that you can go off on. And for me, I just find that fun. Yeah, no, it, it's great. It definitely keeps it interesting and it's very mentally engaging. It, it's not a show that you can turn on and then do the dishes or play with the dog. You have to be watching every moment of it. And can I just, I had two other comments that I wanted to bring out. One, uh, big ups to Walgreen and Walmart for the product placement in this. <laughs> Good God, it could not have been more obvious and more blatant um, unless at some point Marsha Shalali had said, boy, I love shopping at Walmart. They, uh, you Man, the amount of times that they just had a a shot of just the Walgreens logo yeah. while they're in the car was yeah. pretty impressive. Yeah. We know they're in a car in a parking lot. We don't need to know that it's the Walgreens repeatedly. You know, of course, when he loses his daughter in the Walmart, the, the Walmart attendant has to specifically say they're in a Walmart while announcing to all of the people in the Walmart that they're in a Walmart. That was one thing. And the other thing too, I got a feeling I'm going to be saying this every single week, but goddamn, Marsha Shalali can act the fuck out of anything with his face alone. Yeah, it yeah. Is amazing how much he can convey with just subtle changes. And I was thinking of the scene um, after his wife gets back from um, whining and dining the cop to get the information. And he's sitting in that chair and how he just turns on her. And there is barely any movement in his face from one minute before until one minute after but it makes a world of difference and it just it it knocked me out that one particular scene how much he was able to do how subtly when how with just the littlest movements it, you know i i mean i'm not really saying anything surprising here everybody knows he's a phenomenal actor but once again it just blew me away and i a certain extent i feel bad for everybody else in the show because everybody else in the show is doing good acting and nobody is approaching him in this. I would go so far to say that if they don't cast him in this role, that this season doesn't get made because they ran this brand into the toilet with season two. And I don't think a lot of us thought we were ever going to get a season three. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of the buy-in that they're seeing right now is because of his power, not, not because of the cachet of season one. Um, I think I think it's more people want to tune in to see what he's going to do. And through three episodes, he has delivered. Now, before we get out of here, I want to go into some fan comments we got because we promised we would share those on air. So we got some uh, some YouTube comments that were left for us as well as a Twitter comment. So first was uh, Ryan Tchaikovsky, who wrote us after listening last week. They never questioned the one chubby lady that waved to the kids while she was... Uh, taking down the Halloween decorations. And I didn't notice this, but Ryan did. She was in a couple more scenes in the background consoling the mother, and I found that odd. So I think that's a good catch. Um, at some point, they are going to have to revisit that, especially if they used her in multiple scenes. But I'm guessing she probably won't come back into play until maybe the last two episodes. Because I don't oh, think she's going to be the killer. Also, too, though, they may have set that up, though, because remember, in the interview with the TV personality, they were talking about how people were interviewed and there were never follow-ups. Um, and specifically about, you know, the brown car. So that's a great catch. That may wind up being one of the people that there wasn't the follow-up with as we get on into later episodes, and that picture becomes more clear. Well, and I'm so, wondering if she's not the killer, but maybe she's the one that makes the dolls. 
Yeah. Which could be. Our next comment is from uh, Michael uh, Via Villa, and this is directed at me and my theory from last week about how it was going to be the junk man who did it because he is the fox in the metaphor. And uh, what he wrote is Woodward Junkman didn't do it. He is beat or killed by the townspeople. Awesome theory, though, bro. I think he probably saw the preview for next or for this this week's episode where they sh- they teased that. I still think he is a viable candidate, as I already talked about. I don't think they've ruled him out one way or the other. I will say this episode made made me think, have a little more doubt about him, because like you said, it's on the nose. What's in the bag probably isn't the, obviously it isn't the girl's body, because we're assuming she's alive. But we'll we'll just have to see. I'm still going to go with him being a viable candidate. And then our last comment is from Twitter. It is from Chris Myers, who is at Fantasy Chill Pony. And he had, I had the exact same thought process as you, Luke, which means it'll be someone we haven't seen yet. Probably true. Probably true, Chris. Thanks, everyone, for writing in. If you do have a comment or question, want to tell us we're stupid or have your own theory you want to present, just leave it in the comments below or leave it on uh, Twitter, and we will read it out next week when we review episode four.